just ahead on American Black Journal, Policing and Community Safety. We're gonna talk about a program that supports both law enforcement and the community on emergency calls, and we'll look at efforts to change policing in our schools. Plus, Detroit's Trinity International Film Festival is still a go despite the pandemic. We'll get the details. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Since the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the divide between police and the community has grown ever wider across the country. Increasing tensions and misperceptions on both sides have led to a deeper conversation about law enforcement and community safety. My first two guests are directly involved with creating partnerships and strategies that support the police and just as much the people who interact with the police. Misha Stallworth is a board member for Detroit Public Schools Community District, and Sherry McGrill is president and CEO of Northeast Integrated Health. So Sherry, I'm gonna start with you. Um, the, the program that, uh, that you have uh, at your organization, I think is, uh, is really interesting, but it's also a really critical part of the way that I think we're about to rethink policing and, and try to shift it away from uh, just responding with police officers to, to, to crises, but responding with people who can actually help uh, the folks who are, who are in distress and need something. So, so first explain what CAPA is and how it works. EPA stands for Community and Police Partnership and Advocacy. And so it is truly a partnership program, uh, primarily with DPD. We've been partnering uh, with them for over 20 years uh, with the officers, as well as our team, which consists of uh, masters prepared, social workers, psychologists. Uh, we have uh, police officers on our team. We also have um, peers who've been through the justice system. And so it's a, um, a, a three-part program. Actually, we do training for all the officers at DPD when they come on board uh, at the academy. And then we do annual updates for them. We also go into the precincts and do training. We provide follow-up counseling and specialized services for officers. As you know, there's a high rate of um, alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide, depression, all the kinds of issues that the general public have, but um, really ingrained in terms of the kind of stress that those folks um, experience. And then we also have our walk along, ride along program where we're partnered with DPD officers on the street, actually responding to public safety issues. And I think the message for CA about CAPA is that um, public safety is really a partnership. And it's a partnership not just with law enforcement and uh, behavioral health, but also with the business community uh, in terms of all of those resources being deployed in terms of how that impacts them uh, in, in our community and with the potential for all of the violence and the other issues that we're seeing, it really benefits both our downtown community and what we're at, keep hearing and what's being asked for by precincts is they want to move further into the neighborhoods as well because neighborhood policing is the way we need to go. Yeah. 
Uh, and what have you seen or experienced since you've been doing this in terms of the difference in outcome uh, for the people who are, who are being responded to by police? Well, obviously our outcomes um, are, the first number one is safety. We want people to come out um, without having a violent encounter that ends in some kind of danger to residents. Um, and we've seen that for over 20 years. Um, working in this partnership with um, DPD um, side by side, uh, we've been, you know, walking along and riding along and are able to respond to situations and to help diagnose situations so that really um, at worst case scenario, these become misdemeanor situations and not felonies. Mm -hmm. We don't need more people in our jails. We need more people diverted so that they're going into treatment programs or, you know, hospitals if they need be, shelters. Um, but we need human resource deployment, not jail deployment. And so, uh, overall, that this is an evidence-based program. Uh, we've been keeping statistics for 22 years, and we've been able to show a drop in um, those kind of negative outcomes, both safety and diversion. Yeah. So that's what's truly important to us. Yeah. Uh, Misha Stallworth, uh, uh, schools, of course, are, are rethinking um, uh, policing in, in important ways as well. Um, uh, talk about what you guys are doing and how you're taking in this moment and, and the need to really rethink uh, all of that. I, I'll start here. There are some people who say police don't belong in schools and that that is uh, one, of the, one of the big problems. How, how is DPSCD responding to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, police don't... Um police don't belong in schools enforcing our code of conduct, right? So um, the whole thing about disrupting a school to prison pipeline is that you don't treat kids like criminals when they're at school. You address behavior problems from adolescents as if they are behavior problems from adolescents, um, not as if they are, you know, violent crimes, even when students sometimes can be violent. We know that that is a reality. However, it's, you know, part of healthy youth development to receive an intervention at that point and to learn a new behavior, not to be put in handcuffs and then entered into the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that's unique about our school district compared to districts around the country is that the police, the, De the Detroit Public Schools police um, are actually a department within DPSCD, so it is not the city police. Um, and it's an important distinction because what that means is that we have control over how those officers are trained. We have control over um, where they are deployed. We have control over um, what their roles actually are. Um, and we have control over what happens if the police are called by staff for some reason. Um, so in other districts, you know, when the police are called, they're calling in external people. They're calling in people who don't know their staff, who don't know anything about students, who maybe aren't trained in restorative practice. Um, and that's not the case at DPS CDPD. Uh, what is the case that's similar is that we still spend too much on police. Um, you know, we've increased our spending on, you know, nurses and counselors and deans and folks who facilitate positive culture. Um, but we're working on looking at how do we think about safety more comprehensively within the district? How do we engage in that conversation with our community and our families? Um, many folks, I mean, I, I, we're raised to both be concerned about the police, but also to accept that they are the intervention when something happens. And so there are a lot of folks who do think of having police in schools as the safe route. There are other folks who don't want police in schools. So we see this as an opportunity to start having this conversation as a community so that we can think again comprehensively about, sa about safety. We can think about safety in an anti-racist way. We can think about safety in a way that addresses the needs of our students from a healthy youth development approach, our staff so that they're in an environment they feel good in and our families so that they feel welcome in our buildings. Yeah. Um, uh you started a task force where you're getting 
many different facets of the school community together to talk about this and make recommendations. What are you learning from that task force? So right now we're in the process of getting folks um, on the task force and then we'll be able to get started with the work. So I would just really encourage folks to reach out and find out how they can get involved. Diversity of voices is really important in work like this. We, you know, we have to know where folks are thinking, where they're coming from, what kinds of things they're experiencing and how we can learn from them. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's by law, um, this police force has to have an oversight committee um, and so for many reasons, it kind of went away over the last few years, you know, just charge it to the emergency management game. Um, and so now that's being reestablished and we're except uh, we're starting to interview folks for that as well. Um, very similar to the Detroit Board of Police Commissioners in terms of a role looking at discipline, um, continuing to make recommendations. And so uh, the other thing that will happen is from the task force, um, a, an individual will roll over onto the oversight committee so that there's consistency between the work of those two bodies um, while we start to rethink these things. Yeah. yeah. Stephen, I think the thing that Misha said that kind of draws the two programs together, even though our target population is a little different, is that both of the goals of our programs is to um, de-escalate encounters uh, with the police by making social and behavioral health support, uh, consultation, education available, not necessarily um, you know, the kind of interventions that we have been seeing. And the other thing I think that's really important is that we have to have a whole variety of tools in our toolbox to deal with our different populations in all these different situations. So a, a task force, wonderful idea because you're gonna come with a diversity of thoughts and voices that will then expand all kinds of options to be available. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the, and the hope is that we can use, you know, our power as a district to make sure that the environment our students are learning in is one that they do feel safe in, but they also feel affirmed in and don't feel any kind of fear. Um, that's just so critical to a healthy learning environment. Um, we know that there will be situations where people call the police. We know that folks are trained, like yeah. again, you know, uh, call the police, this thing is happening. A fight broke out, call the police, right? See it all the time. Um, and so the other critical part of this task force to me is to say, okay, if we know that that's a reality, then how do we think through the use of our staff in a way that's actually effective and perpetuates the kind of culture that we want to see um, so that we're ready for that moment. I, I really would not want external law enforcement coming into our buildings, you know, when there's a behavior problem with students or even a behavior challenge with parents, you know, and, and all, you know, altercational argument between parents, right? I still would prefer that that is de-escalated to Sherry's point and um, addressed through our school system you know, within a community that cares for and really supports the, and knows, has familiarity um, with, with the members of our community. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced a lot of large events to cancel or go virtual. The organizers of the 14th annual Detroit Trinity International Film Festival have decided that the show must go on. The festival will offer four days of virtual screenings, workshops and panel discussions. The event will highlight the works of more than 40 independent filmmakers. One of the feature films that will be shown on opening night is titled Sprinter. Are you sure you want to do this? I go into America to help our family. Hailed Jamaica's next big sprinting sensation. Rasta Rocket was a brand. 
Does that make some money? You are a dangerous pop. No man can outrun the choices he makes. The film festival runs August 20th through August 23rd. I talked with the organizers, Marcel and Lazar Favors, about the change to a virtual format. First, let's talk about how you hold a film festival virtually. How, how is that going to work? He's looking at me, but I'm looking at him because he, he's the one that really figured it out, figured it all out for us. So it's, it's uh, we, we find a platform that we, um, it took a minute. I had to search for a, a, a platform to host our film festival, and I uh, finally got one. Uh, it's called Eventive, mm -hmm. and what we do, and it, it pretty much helps us navigate through the whole process, just not in person. It's the mm -hmm. same. It's the same process, just not in person. You know, we get we get a chance. This platform allows us to show it all over the world in real time though. So that that's the plus mm. in the virtual world. We, everybody in the world gets to see it. So yeah. And, yeah. Then, and my job has been connecting with the filmmakers. And so we've been holding kind of uh, Zoom sessions with them so people can get to know their films, their journey as filmmakers. So that's been really fun. Yeah. Yeah. That fourteenth year of the film festival, that is a very big big year, a uh, big number. <laughs> <laughs> 14th year, 41 films, and how many Detroit filmmakers? 15 from Detroit. And 15 from Detroit. Wow, wow. Uh, talk about the lineup this year. Oh, wow. Well, we can go with, uh, we have, oh my goodness, we have several documentaries. We have one documentary, it's uh, called Mr. Emancipation, uh -huh. about um, Mr. Perry. Mm -hmm. Walter Perry. Walter Perry, the Walter Perry story. Mm -hmm. That's a great documentary. Um, 50 Shades of... Um, Fifty Shades. Oh my goodness, Fifty Shades. That's what it's called, Fifty, 50 Shades. Fifty Shades. Uh, oh my goodness, Sprinter, obviously. Uh, Amer the Conversation with America. That's a great documentary. Oh my goodness. I just want to talk a little bit about the films yeah. uh, themselves. So Sprinter is about a Rastafarian teenager who uh, is trying to make the national track team. Um, and it's, it's a heartwarming story, you know, about grit and also a family oriented story as well, too, about family. And yeah. the Detroit tie to that story is that David Allen Greer is yeah. also featured in the film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the film that uh, we, we had at the opening of the segment here, a little segment of it. Oh, great, yeah. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. Great and, the, and the other um, story, A Conversation with America, I just think is a very timely film because it, the backdrop it takes place during an election year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what's on the hearts and minds of America during <laughs> an election year? So that's a very timely, you know, film as well. Talk about um, the film industry, though in 2020 and beyond. I, I get worried as I'm stuck at home and watching more television and movies than I have in maybe several decades. Uh, I get worried that I'm, I'm gonna run out soon because they're not really making movies, they're not really making TV anymore. Are we gonna ever have uh, the kind of Hollywood or independent film industry that we had before? Well, I, I wish I had the answer to that. That is uh, the $10,000 question. But I, I will say that there's still an interest. I will say that uh, people have not given up on the idea of, um, and maybe, you know, like the tax incentives, maybe it looks differently. Maybe there's support for filmmakers in a way that will allow, uh, and we're independent filmmakers, but for production companies to, you know, attract more films here. But there, there has to be, in some, I, I think, some incentives in some kind of way, but maybe it can be restructured. And and I know that there, as I mentioned, it's, it's there's still interest there. Uh, and people have still not stopped making movies because of it. Um, they, they, there's still a lot of uh, filmmakers who 
are, you know, have story ideas and are, are getting it done. And as you mentioned, like kind of going forward, we don't know what that looks like as well, too, because um, there are certain standards and guidelines that have restricted, you know, all of us, but specifically in the film industry, um, people are still trying to navigate, uh, you know, how to make films like safely, you know, like in the future. And, um, and there's been a lot of interesting stories that have come out of it. I, I think also around this, you know, the stories of being quarantined and what that yeah. looks like for families and communities. And so we're starting to see a trend in those films that are, that are coming out. Yeah. Uh, one of the great things about Trinity uh, and the work that you guys have done there is the kind of showcase you give to African-American filmmakers, African-American storytellers, uh, talk about this year and how much more important uh, that is. Oh, I think it's extremely important, and that's one of the re that's one of the main reasons we didn't want to cancel the uh, festival this year because we still wanted to give them a platform where people can see their film, see their work, you know, and, and at least at least give them some type of confidence mm -hmm. to keep moving, to keep building, to keep creating through this pandemic. Because I'm sure that this pandemic has has wild and uh, changed a lot of people's perception and, and how they want to do things. But I think things like this and keep continuously showing and creating in a, a safe space, that there are, there are safe ways to do it. It's kind of difficult, but there's safe ways to do it. It's kind of like keeping the distance, um, uh, keep your hands clean, all that kind of thing. So it's, it's working out for some filmmakers. In fact, we've, uh, we have several filmmakers that have shot a few films over the last couple of weeks. Really? I want to talk about the fact that, you know, also in terms of like storytelling, um, the social justice films that yeah. we're seeing and yeah. given a platform to uh, filmmakers, especially uh, African-American filmmakers who have films that speak directly to the times yes. that we're experiencing right now um, with racial injustice and so it, it's giving them a voice right now to be heard through their art. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I think, uh, again, comes into focus at times like this is that this is art. And art is what we turn to in mm. Christ. One of the things that gives us voice uh, and a platform and, and, and film and film festivals, I feel like now take on an even bigger role even more important because uh, everybody is turning to that art uh, to try to make sense of what's what's happening right and, and what i mentioned earlier is that one of my jobs has been connecting with the filmmakers um doing these interviews that we've been doing now so that people can get to know the filmmakers get to know their stories has have been very important for people to not only go get their art out but yeah. to have a voice and and to connect with um, uh, the community in terms of these issues that uh, are going on as well, too. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to cast forward to the 15th annual <laughs> festival. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> What's that going to look like? <laughs> well, 15. Well, well, hopefully it looks like... Um, Looks like in person, and I think we're going to utilize this virtual platform at the same time. Yeah. I think we can mix them, blend them both together, and, and come up with something extremely beautiful. Beautiful for that 15, right? That's a that's a milestone right here. That's a, wow. that's a good one. <laughs> she was done at 10, but she can't move. <laughs> I, I think uh, another thing that has been great that has like come out of this is, is as he mentioned yeah. um doing like a mixture of both i i think we are going to keep this virtual element um and one of the great things about uh having a virtual platform is that usually at film festivals the screens are held just like that one time yeah. but during with with this platform you can have access to the films yeah. for 24 hours yeah. right yeah. so you know sit back in the comfort of your home, you know, check out multiple films yeah. uh, at your leisure. Uh, we just want to give the dates for the festival as well too. August 20th through the 23rd. You can follow uh, all of the filmmakers and see the trailers for the film on any of our social media platforms on uh, Twitter, Instagram as well too. 
Facebook. And Facebook. Definitely Facebook. A lot of the trailers are on there. And the and the website to uh to go see the films are uh D T I F F D T I F dot eventive dot org. And we'll put that on uh, our website as, as Thank well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being such a great uh support to the festival. Uh, all these years, all, as all well these too. years, man. I just love I just love the idea of the festival and I love what what you guys do for the filmmakers uh, and the storytellers who who otherwise would not really get the kind of exposure that they do. So congrats on 14 years and we'll look forward to being together again. Yes. <laughs> we'll hold you to it. <laughs> that is our program for today. Thanks for joining. For more information on our guests, check out AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.